It always feels so cheery and summery walking up to that little bit on the screen there. Hey, I want to say um, Anton and Cecily, who are leading us, and Steve, of course, but Anton and Cecily were leading us in worship in that last song. They're part of our Leadership Institute. You, you may not know this. We have a summer a long internship program, 13 students, uh, college and, uh, and out-of-college students who are pursuing ministry. And so Anton and Cecily serve, uh, are serving this summer in our worship uh, ministries as interns. So thank you so much, both of you, for leading us so well. If you've not been with us, you may not know that we finished a year-long study called The Story of Jesus. Uh, we ended that in, in the first week of June. And we sort of continued that series, that study, by looking at the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're calling this series The Way of Blessing. As Pastor Brian said the very first week, because the Sermon on the Mount is not a set of religious rules we have to adhere to, not a new standard that we have to measure up to. It's a description of the life of blessing, or maybe uh, more accurately or more specifically, it's a description of what it looks like When those of us who claim Jesus as our king live his kingdom values and principles in our lives. We pray, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the Sermon on the Mount is like, well, what does that look like? If his kingdom should come in our lives and in in the way we conduct ourselves, what, what, what does that look like? And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. And that means that if Jesus is your king and his reign covers your life and the Sermon on the Mount is describing how you live out his reign in your life on this earth, There's no part of your life or my life that should be exempt from his reign, from his kingship. You don't get a pass on certain areas of your life. If he's king, he's king. And that means he has rightful reign over all of our lives. And so this morning, we come to the part of Jesus' teaching, which is maybe a little more PG-13 than some of the other parts of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, for those of you that are, you know, if you're nervous about this, I I think that's kind of fun. Uh, It's Jesus' teaching on sex and sexual desire. Now's your time to, t- chance to slip out the back if you, if you want to go. Christians are often accused of being sexually repressed, out of date, way out of step with the modern culture, archaic. And honestly, the passage we're going to look at in just a moment, uh, at, at first glance, at first reading, without any sense of what Jesus is really talking about, can sound um, harsh and a little crazy. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. In this part of this, the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Now that really is a cheery summer message for us this morning. (laughs) Kind of fits with it. The prevailing cultural myth is that sex and sexual desire is like any other human desire. And for the most part, the way to live a fulfilled and happy life is to fulfill those desires that we have. Of course, there are parameters around that we would say in our culture, although increasingly less and less. But the way to be fulfilled and happy in this life is to fulfill your desires. But if it's true that sexual desire is like every other desire, just from, a, just from an observational standpoint, I don't think that's true. Why? We think about the desire for food. I have a longing every evening for mint chocolate chip ice cream. comes upon me. But I have not written poems about that. I have not written songs about that. Dan Fogelberg didn't write, Longer than there have been stars up in the heavens, I have longed for you, mint chocolate chip, right? He didn't write it that way. Where, where are the great love poems about napping? In, in our culture, in our history. We don't write those. Just from, a, just from an observational standpoint, this desire seems to be different in the way we respond to it, write about it, talk about it, and the hold it has over our culture. Listen to what C.S. Lewis uh-huh, writes in his book, Mere Christianity. Either Christianity is wrong, or our sexual instinct as it is now has gone wrong, one or the other. Of course, being a Christian, I think it's the instinct which has gone wrong. Now suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing in a covered plate on the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see just before the lights went out that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone terribly wrong with the appetite for food? And would not anyone who had grown up in in a different world think that in our culture something is equally wrong about the state of sex and the sexual instinct among us? He wrote that in Britain in the 40s. 
And I think he's exactly right and quite prophetic, actually. No other desire has this kind of power over our minds and hearts and, and this kind of influence in our culture. So let's look at three things out of this text that Jesus tells us. The first is the meaning of sex. How's that for an ambitious first point? In this passage, Jesus, when he says, you've heard that it was said, but I tell you, and we've talked about this in the past, but this is a common refrain in the Sermon on the Mount. What he's saying, and Pastor Sterling talked about this last week, he's not saying, I'm doing away with something you heard once upon a time, and I'm giving you a new law to follow. Because he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So when he says, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this, he is building on the Old Testament sexual ethic. He's applying it to our hearts. He's not throwing it out and giving us something new. He's building on that. That's important for us to understand. Simply stated, the Old Testament sexual ethic from the very first chapters of, of the Bible, of the story, all the way through affirmed by Jesus and by Paul throughout this, the, the biblical narrative is that sex, the sexual act, is to be reserved for the covenant relationship of marriage. And marriage is defined all the way through the Bible, always, without exception, as one man and one woman for life. Now, I'm well aware that our culture might disagree with that. But I'm telling you, when Jesus teaches about the sexual desire, he places it in that ethical framework. It belongs in this covenant relationship, one man, one woman, for life. What's a covenant? What do we mean when we say a covenant relationship? Most of us don't use that word. If we think about it at all, we think about it as some sort of religious legal contract. God's covenant with Abraham or his promise to us. And it is that, but it's more. It is, it is much more binding than an emotional attachment. And it's much more intimate than a legal contract. In our culture, certainly. In a consumer contract or a relationship that we would have with a vendor or someone that's providing services for us, you, you make a contract, whether verbal or legal or written or any other way, and it's an agreement. You provide for my needs and desires at a contracted or agreed upon price or rate or whatever, but we're always looking for the better deal. That's expected, right? If you can find someone to do the same work or even better work for less money, it's totally acceptable. In fact, you're foolish not to get out of one contract and to into another. Wouldn't you agree? People do that with legal means and illegal means. I would, I'm looking for the better deal. Because in our culture, my desires, my needs, what I want, are more important than the contractual relationship. So, I'll, you know, like your cell phone provider. Yeah, they have a contract, but who pays attention to that? I'll get out of that thing if I can find a better deal, right? Or there's 100,000 different examples of that. Because what I want and need is really more important than this relationship. This is just necessary for the services to be provided. But in, a, in a, the biblical view of a covenant is different. In the biblical view of a covenant, it is this relationship is more important than my personal needs or desires. So I won't violate this relationship even if I desire something or feel something or want something because this is more important to me. The covenant contractual relationship trumps my feelings. That's why it's so different. A, a covenant then only provides the security and safety that you cannot have otherwise because that relationship is more important than your feelings. Timothy Keller writes, sex is not a consumer good, it's a covenant good. It's not a consumer product, it's a covenant good. Sex is the act of self-giving inside the covenant relationship, self-commitment. It is a representation of what you're doing with your whole life. In other words, I am fully yours, I'm committed to you, and we're going to act that out physically. This is why sex outside of marriage is really, or what Jesus calls adultery, is inconsistent and hypocritical. You're asking someone to do with their body what they will not do with their life. Pastor Brian and I talk about this as pastors. We do premarital counseling, and he said this, and I've said it to other couples as well. When you're, I'll ask couples when I meet with them if they're sexually active together or if they're living together, and if they say yes to that. Sometimes they look at me like, why are you asking us this? Usually it's the guy. And, and, and when we talk about this, it's, and one of the things I like to say to them is because you already know something about your future spouse that you probably shouldn't know. They're willing to, to give themselves to you physically without this relationship, this contractual, covenant, protected relationship. C.S. Lewis, again, in his book, The Four Loves, writes this, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage 
is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual union, from all other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and make up the entire union. So they go together in God's eyes. You can't pull one out. That's why cohabitation or living together does not prepare you for marriage. I know I'm ranting here and this is a long first point, but we're talking about the meaning of sex, right? Living together, even secular sociologists and psychologists will tell you this, that the statistics are not good for those who live together first. We like to think, or it's common to say, well, I'm finding out if we're compatible in all areas. Sex outside of marriage does not prepare you for sex inside of marriage. It harms you for that. Just, just on, a, on, a, on a purely, you know, without even, just respond quickly to me. Would you say that your standards for a roommate are lower than your standards for a spouse? Most of us would say yes. So if you're living with somebody to see if you're compatible and your standards are lower than they would be for a spouse, that's like marketing. That's a really long job interview. You're finding out, do I like this person well enough to, you know, to get married? Because I have a higher standard for marriage, but to find out if they measure up, that's a terrible way to live. There's no security or safety in that. You're learning to live together as co-consumers, not covenant partners. So sex outside of marriage does not prepare you for sex inside of marriage. Let me just wrap this one up by saying the meaning of sex is that it's a sign of the covenant relationship between one man and one woman for life. And you are not to do with your body what you will not do with your whole self, heart, mind, and soul. Now there's a lot more we can say about this. We could spend months of sermons on this, but that's just the first point we have to move on. Next, the danger of lust. Danger of lust. So Jesus says, I, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Don't break this covenant relationship. But I'm telling you that if you even look at a woman with lustful intent, you've already done that. What's he saying here? If you look at a woman lustfully, you're, you've sinned or are in danger of the fires of hell. Most people think he's saying that if you have sexual desires, then you are a dirty sinner and you're going to hell. That is not what Jesus is saying. I think the church has gotten this wrong many times and in many ways throughout history, and that is that we feel bad for sexual desires. Like somehow they're wrong, even inside of marriage. Like, well, we shouldn't talk about that. God, the Bible sort of allows it, but frowns on it. It's not a good thing. Totally wrong. The word Jesus uses for lust here is the Greek word epithemeo. It is most often in the New Testament translated as greed or idolatry. There are other words he could have used for sexual desire, gone wrong, but he doesn't use them. He uses a word that is most often translated greed or idolatry. Why? It refers to the insatiable desire for more, the desire to possess, what we would call an ultimate desire. Trying to extract from sex that which only God can give you through Christ, or money, or career, or anything. So lust, then, as Jesus still uses it, is not just leering at a woman or a man or having those, those thoughts. It's desire out of control. What God intended to be good and beautiful can become terribly destructive. When my boys were 13, each of them, I took them on a little, you know, becoming a man, little time with dad. One of the things we talked about was the sex talk, you know. And I got this analogy from Pastor Brian, which I'm sure he got it from somewhere else, but Maybe he invented it. But it was, you know, sex is like fire, and it belongs in a fireplace, the marriage. Inside there, it's warm, and it's beautiful. It gives light and heat. You can, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Outside the fireplace, you can burn the whole house down. So keep it where it belongs. When I was in, somewhere between my junior and senior year in college, I worked in a camp in the Ozark Mountains. On my way done with that camp, I drove to my friend's house. who was a teammate. He lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and this is the middle of the summer. Going to spend a few days with him. His parents were in Germany, and so we were just hanging out at his house. And one afternoon, we were going to uh, go work out, go out to eat, and then just, you know, but his parents had said, could you do some jobs, his, son, his name is Neil, around the house while you're home alone? One of the jobs was cut down some brush. They had like three acres of beautiful property, burn it in this ravine, and, uh, and you know, burn the brush and just keep the yard up because they had some work to do. So we, Neil said, could you help me with this? I'm kind of behind. I said, sure, no problem. So we're cutting down brush and piling up in this ravine and burning it. This is summertime in Stillwater, Oklahoma, very dry. So then we doused that whole pile of, of ashes with, uh, with a garden hose and water for, a, you know, half an hour or so. Thought we had it good and wet. Went out to work out, out to eat, came back, took a nap on his uh, living room 
couch. And I woke up to the sound of somebody pounding on his back, sliding glass door. Bam, 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 bam. I went to the door, and there's a guy wearing a cowboy hat, belt buckle, boots, going, hey, you know your all darn backyard's on fire? <laughs> like this. <laughs> I looked behind him. There was a six-foot wall of flames across three acres of his yard. Well, you know what happened. The wind had blown and uncovered that layer that we had thought we had soaked the whole thing, and the ashes blew, and the yard caught on fire while we slept. I said, the guy said to me, I was driving by on the road, and I saw the smoke. I know you boys wasn't roasting no weenies back here. So. <laughs> <laughs> we went out there with garden hoses and shovels. It melted through the hose. It burned my eyebrows off. You know, we, we had no chance. We had to call the fire department. They came with those big brush fire trucks and just, you know, sprayed down the whole yard. His three acres, black, gone. Trees like Charlie Brown Christmas trees, just matchsticks, <laughs> just everything gone. Fire out of control. Desire out of control is incredibly damaging, incredibly, incredibly destructive. Now, the Pharisees apparently did not account for or understand this kind of power. They thought, just avoid the act. Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Just don't do, don't commit the act. But he's applying it to our hearts. There was a group of Pharisees known, uh, nicknamed the bruised and bleeding rabbis because they were so concerned about committing a, uh, this sinning by, by, by lusting, that when they saw a woman, any woman from every distance, they would close their eyes to a, a, avoid seeing her and unintentionally lusting after her, but they kept walking. So they were forever walking into things, and you know, seriously, and bruising themselves. And That's not what Jesus is saying here. Now, just to be clear before we move on, God does not condemn sexual desire. The Bible does not condemn it. Quite the opposite. In fact, the Bible actually celebrates it openly in ways that would make you blush. In the, inside the one man, one woman covenant contract of marriage, the Bible celebrates it and talks about it in ways that most English translators, for example, the book of the Song of Songs, can't even bring themselves to translate accurately because it's a little scandalous. In Genesis chapter 2, the second chapter of the Bible... You know the story of creation, right? God creates everything and brings all the animals to Adam to name them. And then he searches throughout all creation to find a, a helper suitable, but none is found. So he puts Adam to sleep, takes out his rib, forms from that rib in the dust of the ground a woman to be his life partner, not his servant, but partner, and then wakes Adam up and brings her to him. And then we have Adam's response. You know what it is? It's the first human love poem in history. He says, ah, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from me and returned to me. He's singing. Why does he call her woman? Because when he saw her, he went, whoa, man. <laughs> I know, I know, but I can't help it. I like that one. Now, don't forget, they're both stark naked. So in the very second chapter of the Bible is a naked man singing before a naked woman and God smiling on all of it. The Bible's not embarrassed about sex. Or Proverbs 15, 19. This is writing to your uh, husband. Let her breasts, your wife's breasts, fill you with delight at all times. Huh, guys? Be intoxicated in her love. You know, there's advantages to taking the Bible literally. Are you embarrassed? You shouldn't be. You can't get around that one. My point is this. The Christian sexual ethic is not embarrassed or repressed or hiding or ashamed. It celebrates it in its place, in its context. So lust, desiring sex, pleasure, is desiring that without a person and without a promise. It dehumanizes people and makes them necessary commodities to fulfill your desires. This is, we don't have time to get into this, but this is the extreme danger of pornography in our culture, which is rampant which if we could flash on this giant screen, what's going on for many of us, it would be shocking. Studies show that pornography, the, the prevailing myth is it doesn't really damage anybody as long as you keep it in its place. It's just between, you know, it's just you and your screen. It's having damage in our culture that's hard even to comprehend. The way women view themselves, what men expect, what's acceptable, it's desire out of control. Desire, desiring that, that act without a person or a promise. And God says, this is going to destroy you. And it is. This is why Jesus seems so extreme and so harsh 
when he says things like gouge out your eye and cut off your hand, I mean, whoa, you know, that seems a little over the top, Jesus. Are you advocating self-mutilation? Do you know in the first century there are a lot of one-handed, one-eyed Christians walking around? No. He's not advocating self-mutilation. What he's saying is, this is so serious, this has so much a hold on your heart, that I want to ask you this question. How drastic are you willing to be? How far are you willing to go to get a handle on this in your life? Your eye, what you see, what you take in, has profound implications on your heart. Pay attention to that. Don't ignore that. Guard that. Martin Luther says you can't stop the birds from flying around your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. <laughs> What's the point? You can't, sexual desire is part of who we are as human beings. But you must be careful of what you expose yourself to. Your hand, what you do, where you go, your actions. Guard these things, Jesus says. And the word he uses for hell is the word uh, Gehenna. It's a transliteration of the Hebrew compound word Gehenam. It was referred to the Valley of Hinnom. That's an actual valley to the south of Jerusalem. You'll see an image of it here on the screen. That just, just to the lower end of the smoke there, the valley at the bottom of the, the, the subdivision, that's today. In Jesus' day, this is the south side of the wall of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And in his day, this was like a city garbage dump. Uh, refuse was burning there most of the time, kind of like that pit smoldering in my, my friend's backyard. And it was also a place where on occasion, executed criminals that weren't claimed by a family or had a grave paid for would be dumped in that valley and burned as well. The image was one of, uh, it's pretty horrific, Decay, destruction, burning. So Jesus is not just saying, if you, if, you ha- if you have lustful thoughts, you're going to hell. He's saying, if you don't get a hold of this in your life, you will unleash all kinds of forces of decay and destruction in your life and in the people's lives around you that you can't even comprehend. That's how serious it is. This brings us to the power of love. Let's look at the story from the New Testament from John chapter 4. This is a story that many of you will know. It's called The Woman at the Well. I'm going to read to you this latter part of his, Jesus' encounter with this woman. Verses 13 through 18. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband. What you have said is quite true. The woman said to him, uh, He said, You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. We'll stop there. Now, when Jesus says to this woman, this Samaritan woman at a well at midday, who's going there because she's an outcast, and Jesus, being a faithful Jewish rabbi and seeing a Samaritan woman, would have nothing to do with her, but he does, and there's a lot we can say about that. We've talked about that in previous series. What I want you to notice is when he says to her, I am going to give to you living water, but you'll never be thirsty again. You won't have to keep coming here and drawing water. He's speaking about something spiritual, and she only partially understands what he's saying, but she wants this. And she says, give me this water. And what does Jesus say? Think about the power of this scene, right? I offer you living water, for you, which you'll ne- if you drink of what I offer you, you'll never be thirsty again. She says, I want that. And he goes, call your husband. Does that sound like a non sequitur to you? Why does Jesus, when this woman says, I want this living water, he goes, oh yeah, go call your husband. Why does Jesus bring up her messed up sex life when she talks about living water? Why? Why would he do that? He's not changing the subject. It's precisely the point. He says, I offer you something to satisfy your soul. Remember the word Jesus used for lust, epithemeo, greed or idolatry. Trying to extract from someone or something that which only God can give you in Christ. That's what she's been doing. He says, you've had five husbands. The guy you're with now is not your husband. What's she been doing? Trying to water her soul with these men, with these relationships. Never being satisfied, never fulfilled. And so when she says, I want this water, he says, call your husband. He's pointing on the very place where she's been desiring the wrong thing. 
Actually, you know, the, the truth is sexual desire is a good thing. Again, to quote C.S. Lewis in his book, Screw Tape Letters, he, uh, this is the demon screw tape saying, never forget that when dealing with the pleasure, specifically sexual pleasure, you are on the enemy's grounds, meaning the enemy is God, because this is a demon writing. If you don't know the book, it's fascinating. We are on the enemy's grounds. All our research, demonic research, he says, has not allowed us to come up with one pleasure. All we've been able to do is corrupt them. Isn't that brilliant? It's a God-created, God-given good thing that has been horribly corrupted. So Jesus says to her, call your husband. Why? Because he wants to put it open, expose the very place where in her soul where she most needs this living water. Because she's filling it with the wrong stuff. Remember that Jesus' kingdom is, is supposed to be uh, radically countercultural. Living life in the kingdom of God on earth means we're going to look different. Where else would we look more different than in the sexual ethic in this day and age? Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity in which he examines how is it that this tiny, insignificant sect within Judaism outlasted the Roman Empire and conquered Europe? I mean, how did this happen? Historically speaking, it's astonishing. And he looks at some of the differences in the Christian community versus the surrounding communities. And one of the things he says about the Christian, early Christians was their sexual ethic. Here's what he writes. The pagan Roman society was promiscuous with their bodies, and stingy with their money. The early Christians were exactly the opposite. Generous with their money and wealth and stingy with their bodies. Which has the power to transform hearts in a society? in our culture, or in the ancient world. You see, sex and sexual desire is really a signpost. It's meant to point us toward something, toward someone. How many of you have dogs as pets? I promise I'm going somewhere with this, <laughs> right? What do you do when you say to your dog, go outside, go over there, and you point? What does your dog do? Do they go? Sometimes. You know what my dog does? Runs up and sniffs my finger. Ivy, get out of here, right? She looks at my finger, right? No, not my finger, over there where I'm pointing. But the dog just stares at your finger. Why? Because there's a dog, they're dumb. But the point is, right, they're, they're missing what I'm pointing to. In a way, I think we're like the dog in this situation when it comes to sex. Our culture is fixated on the thing when God gave it to us to point to something greater. There's more to the fact that Jesus says he is the bridegroom and we are his bride. We think about being that relationship being consummated in heaven someday. Sexual desire is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. God gave it to us to be in the place he created it, the marriage covenant, because that relationship is pointing to our union with him. That he is the fulfiller of all our desires. And until God fulfills your desires, until he loves you the way he's meant to love you, you're really not fit to love anybody else. For some of you, you know, you're married and you're married for years, and this is a, I just want to remind you of what a great gift God has given you. Don't ignore that or, or abuse that. Take that for granted. Some of you hope to be someday. You long for it. I pray that that's God's will for you. But in the meantime, until Jesus is a lover of your soul, you're not fit to love somebody else's. For some of us, this is a painful thing. It's, we've, we've sinned in this way in the past, and this has caused brokenness in our lives in some way. We celebrated his grace at the table a few moments ago. His grace covers that. And he calls you into a different relationship with him. Because until Jesus is the lover of our souls, we're not fit to do that for anyone else. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we do thank you. Even though this is a difficult teaching at times, and for some of us it makes us squirm or it causes us a bit of pain, we celebrate its beauty and its power. Even though we fall short and our culture is getting this terribly wrong, we thank you that your word is good. Your truth has power to change lives. Help us to see that, to see that what you created is good in the way that you created it, in the place, in the context. Forgive us for getting this wrong. Protect our minds, bodies, and spirits. Help us to live out the values of your kingdom even in this way, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.